<laughs> but I'm thankful for him filling in that position for me. If you have your Bibles, would you turn to the book of Ephesians? Ephesians, that's right after Galatians. That's in the New Testament part of your Bible. Back uh, towards the ending of the book, almost Ephesians chapter number 6. Ephesians chapter uh, number 6. We'll begin reading in verse number 10 through uh, verse number 14 of Ephesians chapter number 6. And once you found your way there, would you stick your finger in that part of the Bible? And then would you flip back to the book before it to Galatians chapter number 5. And we'll just read verse number 1. That's Galatians 5. But you're finding your way to Ephesians 6. And once you found both of those places, I know that's hard. Why don't you stand to your feet? If you don't have a Bible, we provide one. There should be one in the pew if there's not. Uh, just snuggle up close to somebody who has a Bible, and I'm sure they would be willing uh, to let you read off of their Bible. Ephesians chapter number 6, verse number 10 is where we'll begin reading. It says, and Paul is writing under the direct inspiration of the Holy Spirit when he says, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord, and in the power of his might, put on the whole armor of God, that ye may, ab that ye may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. That word wiles means deceit. The devil is deceitful. He is. He'll trick you with lies. We heard that this morning as Brother Eric preached out of Ecclesiastes where uh, Solomon said, Vanity, vanity. Everything is vanity. Everything is emptiness. But I'm glad that God comes in and he makes everything whole. And what a, we're so thankful for that. So we see that uh, you, need, you need to be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. Verse number 12, For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Wherefore, take unto you, uh, I'm sorry, wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God, that ye may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all to stand. Verse number 14 is where we really want to hone in. Stand, therefore, having your loins girt about with truth, and having on the breastplate, of righteousness. Flip back over to uh, Galatians chapter number 5, and we're just going to read uh, verse number 1. But if you notice in Ephesians uh, chapter number 6, that word stand come up a lot in that chapter. See, as a Christian, you're going to have to take a stand in your life against some things. So we see here in Galatians chapter number 5, verse number 1, it says, Stand. He begins out right there, Paul, and he says, Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty wherewith Christ hath made us free. Thank God for that. And be not entangled with the yoke of bondage. I'm so glad that Jesus came, oh, uh, 2,000 plus years ago, and he broke that bondage for us. He broke that yoke, so no longer do we have to be underneath sin. See, when you get saved, although we may still sin, God has forgiven you of that sin. And what, we are so thankful for that. I want to preach to you for just a few moments, I promise. I'll keep my eye on the, on, the, on the time. Pastor told me, now, you're not me, so don't go until 12.30. And I said, well, I don't think that I have enough vocabulary to go until 12.30, but he does. So <laughs> I promise I'll get you out of here at a decent time so you can get to the restaurant. It'll be the first time you're the first one seated in the restaurant. I want to preach to you on this subject this morning, what it takes to stand. What it takes to stand. Let's bow our heads for a word of prayer. Our most gracious Heavenly Father, Lord, I'm thankful that, Lord, you've given me the, uh, uh, the, the opportunity and the privilege to stand behind the sacred desk and to preach your word of God. And, Lord, I do not take it lightly. Ever since I found out that I had to preach, which was Thursday, Lord, you know that uh, we've talked numerous times about what it is that you want uh, me to preach on. And I believe that you've given me that today. God, I'm thankful for that. Lord, would you please be with these people? Help them to be receptive and listening. Lord, bring us back this evening for another great service. Lord, we're thankful for this beautiful day and the warm weather you've given us. Please be with our pastor as he's away. Keep him safe, Lord. Uh, keep their vehicle safe. Put a hedge of protection about it and get them here safely so we can hear from them on Wednesday night about the good time that they had. Lord, just be with us this morning. We need you. We need you. Oh, we need you. Please be with us and please be with these people. We love you. Your precious and holy name. Amen. You may be seated. What it takes to stand. In your Christian life, and not only in your Christian life, but in your daily life, there are things that you're going to have to take a stand against. There are things that the world is going to try to push on you that you're going to have to step back and you're going to say, hey, I don't think I should do that. That is when uh, your character is going to be truly tested is when you take a stand. I, I'm a very young man. Some of you may say, I'm still a boy. I'm only 21 years old. 
And it seems like every time I flip on Facebook or I flip on Twitter or something else, it seems like somebody else is sitting down when they should be taking a stand. There are so many churches today that used to stand for good, godly, biblical truths, and they've turned their back on those. They've turned their back on music. I just said recently to Miss Danielle, I was driving her home, me and Alicia, and we were talking about music and how it's, it's infil infiltrated into our church. They call it the emerging church. It's nothing but a bunch of hogwash. And I said to her, I said, you change your stance on music, you put drums on the platform. I said, where do you stop? Where do you stop? See, you've let the devil get a foothold into your life and you've said, well, you know, we can reach so-and-so if we would just play their music. No, mm -mm. no. I believe that if we preach the Word of God and we still play those good old hymns, Miss Rachel plays them uh, beautifully, masterfully. They still speak to my heart. It's the spirit within you. See, rock music and uh, contemporary music, it, it quenches the spirit. And it brings about immoral acts in your mind. And it, it, it's all about me. It's all about me. i got to jump around. i got to wave my hands. Hey, this thing ain't about me. It's about him. Amen. Pastor says it all the time. Worship ought not to make you want to wiggle. It should make you want to worship, right? We shouldn't want to uh, put ourselves uh, on for man. And that's what it is. It's a men pleaser. It's not a God pleaser. And I believe if you were to ask me today, does God condone rock music, con contemporary Christian music, which how do you define the line? No, he does not. He needs you to take a stand against that and say, bless God, as long as our pastor is a pastor of this church and he says rock uh, Christian music, CCM is never going to step uh, in this church, you ought to stand with your pastor. He's taken a stand. So many men of God have turned their backs and turned their heads and said, well, let's just let the people do what they want. No, uh, uh, uh. the pastor is supposed to be the shepherd. The pastor is supposed to protect the flock. Hey, if pastor says don't do this and don't do that, I would listen to him. He's been around the block a couple times, right? I mean, he's seen a lot of things and done a lot of things and he's trying to protect you from some things. But in our Christian life, we're going to have to take a stand. And as a young man, I see so many people who've given a foothold to the devil. And I'll be honest with you, it's one of my greatest fears, Brother Hawk. It's one of my greatest fears. I constantly, constantly have to keep myself on guard. You know why? Because the emerging church runs, I would say each church probably runs over 500, wouldn't you say? I mean, they're huge. Who wouldn't want that? Who wouldn't want a full auditorium with people who are excited to be in church? You know what a lot of the problem is? Is our churches are dead. I mean, they're as dry as last year's artificial Christmas tree. Am I right? I mean, people come in. Nobody says hello. The music is, eh, eh, eh. Man, liven that thing up. Bring some spirit into the church. Tell somebody, say, man, it's good to see you today. Man, I've been praying for you and truly mean it. But that's the problem is, is we've, we've, we've lost our stand in America. Have we not? So many things that our country was built upon, the things that people gave their life for, the things that they stood against, it's so quickly just falling away. We've given, a, we've given a foothold to the devil, have we not? It's so quickly, so quickly we see our country just falling off. I mean, how many times in history have we seen a dictator take away weapons from a country and what happens? They turn around and they use those weapons against those people that they just took them from. And I am a Second Amendment person. Bless God, I'm a Second Amendment person. And if they try to take my weapon, <laughs> I'd like to see them try, Brother Hawk. But how many times have we seen our country turn their head? And you know what we've done? We've sat down. We haven't taken a stand. But you know, what that, you know where that stems from? You know, we'll blame a lot of things on a President Obama. And trust me, he's not a perfect man, but I still pray for him, and I hope that he gets saved. He's not a perfect man. He's not. And you know what? If you were in the position of president, you don't know the decisions you'd make. And I don't know the decisions I make. So for me to say I can do that better, well, maybe you can, but you're not in that position. You ought to just pray for him. Because God sets up kings and God takes down kings. We've seen that throughout the Bible. But as so many things as Obama tries to get rid of, you know what he's done? He showed everybody else that we're weak and we're willing to change our stance. And you know where that stems back from? The church. 
The church used to stand against things, Brother Hawk. The church used to say, nope, sin is sin, that's wrong, and we're not going to tolerate it. But now we have this newfangled way of thinking about things as uh, we're going to appease this people. And I got no problem with appeasing the people. But you know what? When it contradicts the Word of God, when it contradicts the King James Bible, you ought to stand against it. We need to stand against some things, and that's why our country, uh, part of the language, is going to hell in a handbasket. It's because the church has given a foothold to the devil and we've given up on things. So I want to encourage you today. What does it take to stand? You say, well, I have to stand on my feet to stand. Yeah, but it takes a lot of other things to stand. I believe, and I'm not, uh, I'm not good in sports. I've never played sports. It was always, practice was always on Wednesday night. We always went to church, so I wasn't able to play sports. But I believe that if we were to play a sport today, a lot of it would stem on your stance, would it not? A football player, I don't know what you would call him, the front liner, what would you call that? Somebody who stands in the front. A guard, I don't know what you even call him. But you know what? If he stands there like this, what is it? A lineman, perfect. If he stands like this, don't you think it's going to be easy to knock that guy over? But if he gets his feet down and he stands like this, like you see those guys do, it's going to be hard to push him over, isn't it? You know what he's done? He stood against the enemy. The enemy is trying to get in to take the ball from the quarterback. See, I know the quarterback. Ha ha. You didn't think I knew that. I almost called it quarter pounder, but that's all right. But you know what? When he puts his feet like this, that person's going to have a harder time to get through him, isn't he, Brother Hawk? He's took a stand. If you play baseball, it's all about your stand. If you play hockey, well, you just have to be a man to play hockey. Bless God. Thank you, Mrs. Valentine. That is the best sport out there. And I know everything about that. Offsides, you know, uh, everything, icing. I know all that stuff. But it's going to take stance. And when you play a sport, you've got to have the right stance. A, you'll hurt yourself. Or B, they're going to get through and they're going to attack the person you're protecting. Maybe we need to take that in our church, right? Maybe we need to stand and say, that enemy ain't coming through. Not happening. Not happening. I am going to stand here like a frontliner, whatever you called it, and I'm just going to say, bless God, I know I can't do it on my own. It's going to take God. It's going to take God to stand. I'm just going to tell you that up front. It's going to take God to stand. Because there's many times in your life where you're going to be weak. And there's going to be times where you're going to say, Yo, I really don't want to argue with this person. I'd rather just sit down. And let me just give you this, uh, let me just give you this side note. This just this side note. Don't argue with somebody over something because as soon as you start to argue, you're giving the devil a foothold. And you know why? Because if you go all the way back to the book of Genesis at the beginning, do you know what uh, Eve's demise was? She began to argue with the devil. She began to argue with him. And he said, Yea, hath God said that? And she thought, Oh, man. Did he? I forgot though because I'm so in the heat of the battle of arguing. Don't argue with people. You know what? If somebody wants to say, well, I don't think your God's alive, and I want you to show me in the Bible where it says that he is, or I want you to show me in historical proof, just say, well, you know, I hope you work that out. But uh, here's, here's something that I can help you with to maybe help you guide you in the fact that he is alive and he's well today. But don't argue with people. There's no sense in arguing. But you also need to take a stand against some things and say, you know what? I don't really appreciate you saying that. So I want to look at three characters of the Bible. This is very simple, I promise. I am a bottom shelf cookie kind of guy. I don't like to complicate things. I'm more of a, a topical preacher instead of an expository preacher. But that's all right. God will use it. Uh, would you turn over to the beginning of the Bible in Genesis chapter number 39? Genesis 39. We'll begin reading in verse number 7. You'll have to keep your Bible. We're going to turn to uh, two other different places. Genesis 39, verse number 7. This should be a familiar story with all of you. This is the story of Joseph. And Joseph here has been sold into slavery. He went to go see his brothers, and he went to tell them another dream. And his brothers got so angry at him that they wanted to kill him. But one of their brothers said, maybe we ought not to kill him. Let's sell him into slavery, and let's make some money on this guy. So they sell him into slavery, they buy him, and now we see that he's in Egypt. And he's having some difficulties in Egypt, but God is using him. God is using Joseph throughout his entire life, God uses Joseph. And we see now that he's working 
in Potiphar's house. And let's begin reading in verse number uh, 7 of chapter number 39. Verse number 7, it says, It came to pass after these things that his master's wife cast her eyes upon Joseph. And she said, Lie with me. But he refused and said unto his master's wife, Behold, my master wanteth not what is with me in the house, and he hath committed all that he hath to my hand. See, his master had given everything to Joseph. He said, Joseph, you have free reign. When I'm not here, you are in authority. What you say goes. So we find here that Joseph is in a prominent position. And we find a lot when people get to positions, when they get to become uh, who they think they ought to be, it seems like they start to go crazy. They start to do things that they said they would never do. And you've got to be really careful of that. So we find here that uh, his, his master's wife cast her eyes upon Joseph. And uh, verse number 8, But he refused and said unto his master's wife, Behold, my master wanteth not what is with me in the house, and he hath committed all that he hath to my hand. There is none greater in this house than I, neither hath he kept back anything from me but thee, because thou art his wife. How then can I do this great wickedness and sin against God? We find here, and I'm using, you'll see today, this is, this is not my kind of Bible. I like the small Bibles. This thing is heavy. But this is my grandfather's Bible, and I cherish this Bible. And I am so thankful for the many notes that he has in it. Man, if I could show you this Bible, it is pinned all over from just notes that he got through the years. This was his reading Bible. And I, he pinned next to verse number 8, he said he was accountable to his master, his maker, and his morals. We find here that Joseph, through all of his tragedy, has come to a position of prominence. And Joseph can have every single thing that he wants. But the one thing that hasn't been given to him wants him the most. See, sin is always going to try to find its way in. Number one I see, and we can attest, and we're going to look at three, three men, well, more than three men, but we'll get to that. We're going to look at three men in the Bible on what it takes to stand. Number one I see, it has to take character. Man, Joseph had some character. And if you would read down through this, you would figure out that, Every time he'd come back, because Joseph was a man of character, Joseph was a man who did absolutely everything at the same time every single day. That was his ritual, and that's what he did. And every single day, his master's wife would come to him and say, Lie with me, Joseph. My master's away. The people are away. Joseph, come on. But Joseph said, Man, I got some characters about me. I know, and I, I love it, right there in verse number 9. How can I, can't, how then... Can I do this great wickedness and sin against my master? No, that's not what he says. What does he say? He said, how can I do this wickedness and sin against God? See, Joseph had some character. Joseph said, although it's very tempting, and the devil's always going to be tempting, although it's very tempting, and maybe I could get away with it, Joseph had some character. And Joseph said, you know... I've been around the block a couple times, and I just don't think this is a good idea. And how could I do this to my God? How could I do it to Him? It seems like more and more every day, people just are turning aside and not taking their stand against things that they used to do. How could they do that against God? Forget me. Man, I look on the outward appearance, but God looks on the inward appearance. The Bible tells us that. And I may look at Brother Hawk and say, man, he's a great guy. Man, he's got a good heart. Man, he loves the Lord. But on the inside, he may say, well, I hate God. But this and that, this and that. But man, love somebody. And we see here that it's going to take character, is it not? And if you were to read the entire book of Genesis, that last part where Joseph comes in, Joseph had character, did he not? I mean, this guy went through the ringer. His family hated him. His brother sold him into slavery. Here he is in a land where Jews are dogs. I mean, they're treated the worst of the worst. But even though this guy, being a Jewish male, makes his way to providence. So we find here that she wants to lie with him, so it's going to take character to stand away. So we find that she finally ends up coming to him and putting her hands upon him, and she takes his coat, and when her master comes home, she says, Oh, he did this, and he did that, and here's his coat to prove it. But the best thing in that story is, you know what Joseph did? Even though he was tempted greatly and greatly, and it happened time and time again, he never looked at her, he never cast her eyes upon her, and when it finally came down to the rubber meat in the road, Brother Hawk, where she grabbed a hold of him 
and said, you know what? We're doing this. He got out of there. He got out of Dodge. Sometimes in our life, we need to just get out of there, Brother Hawk. Just get out of there. Man, if something is so tempting, maybe you have a problem with uh, uh, telling jokes around the water cooler at work, and maybe they're standing around and they say, well, you got any good jokes today? Maybe you should be like, you know what? Don't just turn around and run away, by the way. You're gonna, <laughs> people are going to be like, woohoo, what happened to this guy? But you know what? Maybe you should say, you know what? Uh, uh, not today, guys. You know, you know, not today. And walk away. Get away from this situation. Get away. And the whole time that you walk away, say, God, give me strength to walk away from this situation. God, give me strength not to fall prey to temptation. It seems like every morning I try to, and I'm not patting myself on the back. Trust me. It seems like every morning I pray and I say, God, I don't know what temptation I'm going to face today, but I'm going to need your help to stay away from it. You ought to pray that every single day of your life. Every time you open your eyes, every time you pillow your head at night, say, God, guard my eyes. Men, 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 guard your eyes. There are women out there who are seeking to just uh, devour men. It's happened so many times to preachers. It, 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 every single time, it breaks my heart. Churches of uh, just uh, great influence in our country, and they're just destroyed by one thing that they do. So men, guard your eyes. Women, guard your eyes. It goes the same for women also. There are things that we're going to have to stay away from. To take a stand, you're going to have to have character. 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 And we see here, Joseph had character. Joseph never lied with her. Yet Joseph gets the penalty as if he did. He goes to jail, but you know what? God saw him through it. And God said, Joseph, oh man, Joseph, even though it doesn't make sense right now, man, someday... Your dad's going to come to live with you, and your brothers are going to come to live with you, and it's going to be tough. And it's going to take some character, Joseph, but I'm molding you and I'm training you. I say it all the time. Every trial and every tragedy that we ever go through, and yeah, I hate them, and I wish that we didn't have to go through them, but you know that God is taking you, and you're like a piece of clay in his hand, and he's going, oh, Elliot, oh, man. Man, when you get on the other side of this thing, oh, man, your life's going to be different. You are going to be one changed man. And he, he's molding us into the creatures that he wants us to be. And we see that in Joseph's life. Joseph just didn't wake up one day and have character. It took him a life of tragedy to become the man that he was and to leave behind a legacy. So we find what it takes to take a stand. It's going to take some character, number one. Number two, jump over to 1 Samuel. 1 Samuel chapter number 17. 1 Samuel chapter number 17, verse number 44, 45, and 51 of 1 Samuel 17. This should be a familiar story to all of us. This is the story of David and Goliath. See, I told you I was a, a bottom shelf cookie guy. All of us know about Joseph. All of us know about David. Very simple. I shouldn't have to tell you the story. But I find here... Uh, secondly, so first we had, you have to have character to stand. It's going to take some character. Secondly, it's going to take some courage. What better person in the Bible that has courage than David himself? So let's look at verse number 44 and 45. Then said David to the Philistine, Thou comest to me with the sword and with the spear and with the shield, but I come to thee in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom thou hast defied. And I am sorry, I did not read verse number 44. And the Philistine said to David, Come to me, and I will give thy flesh unto the fowls of the air, and to the beast of the field. Just a parenthetic right here. God gives the flesh to the fowls. It says that in Luke 12, 24. So for Goliath to say that, you know what Goliath is saying? I'm better than God. Because I'm going to kill you, and the birds are going to come and eat you. Because I'm so great and I'm so powerful that I'm just going to summon it and it's going to happen. No, 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 no. The Bible tells me in Luke that God giveth uh, the food to the ravens, does he not? So how could Goliath compare himself to God? How could he? The birds could have seen David dead and flown right over him. But God giveth food to the ravens, not Goliath. So write that in your Bible. God giveth flesh, not Goliath. So we see here... Goliath has come, and he's taunting the children of Israel. And the children of Israel are afraid. If you were to read before this, they were terrified. I mean, I did some stats for you. 
Did you know that Goliath stood nine feet tall and nine inches from the ground? We're talking about David. This guy is a sheep herder. I was trying to look it up, and some scholars say that David was probably between the age of 13 uh, through 15. Because to be in the army of Israel, you had to be of the age of 20 to fight for Israel at this time. And so they say that he wasn't quite at that age yet. He was just younger than his brother. So he goes to see his brothers. His father says, I want you to go see your brothers and I want you to take their pledge. He wants him to go and see how his brothers are doing and come back and tell his father. Because his father, I'm sure, is worried about his brothers. Because I'm sure word had gotten through the tribes and the children of Israel that, man, Goliath is there. And he's big and he's angry and he wants to destroy. So we see that his dad, Jesse, David's dad, calls him and he says, take this uh, cheese and bread and other stuff and go down to your brothers and check on them and come right back here. Can you do that, David? David says, yes, sir, I'm on it. We always find David saying, yes, sir, and doing what his superior told him to do. And that's uh, great in itself. So we find David going down and David gets there and David's like, what in the world is going on? I mean, oh, we've got all the children of Israel basically trembling at Goliath. Here they are. Who? What are we going to do? And every time at the same time, Goliath would come out. He'd say, who wants to fight me? Come on out here. This is a dude that stands nine feet tall, nine inches tall. Are you going to fight a guy like that? No. I'm going to do what Joseph did. I'm going to flee when a guy like that comes at me. So we see nine feet tall, nine inches. And do you know that his coat weighed nearly 200 pounds? If he'd have just taken off his coat, his coat, and set it on David, he'd have squashed him flat. His coat weighed 200 pounds. His spear, just the tip of his spear, weighed 15 pounds. Brother Jeff, 15 pounds. Can you imagine lugging that around all day? 15 pounds is spear. I can only imagine how much his sword weighed. It, 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 the Bible doesn't tell us how much it weighed, but I'm sure it weighed a lot. And so we find here... That David comes and David's like, what in the world is going on? David goes up to Goliath. And you know what he says to him? You come to me with the spear and the shield, but I come to you with God. You know what? Let me just give you this parenthetic. Sometimes in your Christian life, you're going to get to a place in your Christian life where you're going to take a stand for God. You're going to have character. It's going to take some courage. And here David's standing. Here's Goliath. He's maybe looking up at him. Sometimes in your life, there's going to be a Goliath standing in your way. But can I tell you, even though Goliath's really big, and even though Goliath's coat may weigh 200 pounds, and even though Goliath's wielded a sword, and he's got a spear, and he's got a shield, and it seems like, oh man, I just can't get past Goliath. Can I tell you that God's a lot bigger than Goliath? You know why? Because God was looking over at Goliath saying, ho, ho, man, today you're about to get smoked by a young man. And oh, Goliath, you may be big and you may be tall, but this little old shepherd boy, he's got some courage behind him. And he says, you come to me with your spear and your shield, but I come to you with God. See, David had some courage and he said, even though this may seem too hard for me, even though I may not be able to get past Goliath, I got a big God and my God's going to see me through on the other side of this thing. And we see there that David grabs his sling, grabs some smooth stones, and what does he do? Slings those stones. Pow! Right through his head. Falls to the ground. Big old Goliath. You think when he fell, a tumble hit the earth. And the whole thing began to shake. And there's the children of Israel. There's Saul maybe standing up in his tent looking and he's going, somebody bring me my glasses. I don't think this is really happening. That little guy did not, I, he's cleaning his eyes. He's going, what just happened? And there's Goliath laying on the ground. And he says, whoo! And you know what David does? David walks over to him, grabs his shield. I'm talking, this is David. Grabs his shield. And this is about to get R-rated. Cuts his head off. Grabs his head. I mean, this young man is a man's man. This guy's got some courage, Brother Hawk. Goliath's really big in our lives. Man, he's big, Brother Hawk. Brother Gold, Goliath's big. Sometimes... It seems like he's winning. Sometimes I cower in my tent and I say, I don't know how we're going to make it. 
Can I tell you, God's bigger than Goliath. Amen. And even though the odds on your side are really small, David had a big God on his side, so his odds were even bigger than Goliath's. And we see that, Goli or that David smokes Goliath right there. And you know what? I'm sorry, I, I didn't write down the verse, and I don't know why. But you know that after it says that he killed him, I'm sorry, it's right here. Verse number 51, look down with me. Uh, right after that period, it says, And he cut off his head therewith, and when the Philistines saw that their champion was dead, listen here, they fled. Here's a bunch of cowards. Here's a bunch of guys who were putting all their hope in one man who just got smoked by a young kid. And you know what they did? Goliath's dead! We gotta go! I mean... A young shepherd boy just killed their guy who was leading in the fight, the guy who gave them all their strength, and they fled. They got out of there. I love that. I love that. And when they saw their champion was dead, they fled. See, in our lives, we're going to have to face Goliath, and it's going to be tough, but God's going to give you the resources to take over Goliath. And when God, takes, when God gives you those resources to take over Goliath, you know what's going to happen? That devil that's been on you and his minions and the man, they've been fighting you and man, it's been really tough and man, it doesn't seem like there's ever any light in this world and man, it's really tough and I just can't seem to get through. Man, as soon as Goliath's dead, all of them are going to flee. They're going to take off because they're going to say, whoa, this guy's got something. So number one, to take a stand, you're going to have to have character. And we can all attest Joseph had character. David had character. And secondly, it took courage, did it not? I mean, I promise you, I'm not going to go out today and I'm not going to go up to a guy who's nine feet tall, nine inches high, and say, let's fight. Because I'm probably going to get my rear kicked by him. But we see David had some courage. It's going to take courage to stand. I'm not going to lie. This being a Christian is not easy. Man, it's tough. There's some days where Brother Hawk, I don't want to read my Bible. I got other things to do. I got to do this. I got to do that. I don't want to read my Bible. But you know what I'm doing? Not taking a stand. I'm giving the devil a foothold in my life, and I've just stepped back. And then there's other times where I want to get up and read my Bible. But it seems like more than that, there's times where I don't want to read my Bible. Take a stand. Have courage. Have character. Lastly, and I'm watching the time. Lastly, we find consistency. To take a stand is going to take character, courage, and consistency. Can you turn over to Daniel? Right after the book of Ezekiel, the next big book of the Bible, Ezekiel, and then you'll find Daniel. We're going to be right there at the beginning in verse, or chapter number 3, verse 11 through 14. Daniel 3 11 through 14. <coughs> and the word of God reads, and whoso, uh, and whoso falleth not down and worshipeth, that he should be cast into the midst of the burning fiery furnace. There are certain Jews whom thou hast set over the affairs of the province of Babylon, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. These men, O king, have not regarded thee. They serve not thy gods, nor worship the golden image which thou hast set up. Verse number 13, Then Nebuchadnezzar, in his rage and fury, commanded to bring Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Then they brought these men before the king. Nebuchadnezzar spake and said unto them, Is it true, O Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, do not ye serve my gods, nor worship the golden image which I have set up? See, right here, Nebuchadnezzar's playing dumb. Nebuchadnezzar knew that they didn't bow before his golden image. And you know, if you were to read before that, did you know that Nebuchadnezzar, after they had sustained from eating the Babylonian meats and said, just give us fruit, check us out, we're going to be healthier than your healthiest men that you have in your city. So Nebuchadnezzar does it. And you know what? They're better. So you know what he does? He sets them in positions over people. And we find when God sets you over something, when God sets you in a position, right on the heels of that, there's going to be criticism. I promise you. Amen. Everybody says, man, I want to be the pastor. I want to be the pastor. Man, I just want to be the pastor because then I can make all the decisions. You better be ready for criticism. 
You ready to be ready for sharp words and things that are going to hurt you. I promise you, the best thing you can do to your pastor is to pray for him. Man, there are so many temptations. There are so many uh, people who want to destroy the man of God. It is so prevalent in our country. So many times in our country, the first person to fall is the pastor. It should not be like that. But you know what? The devil is working on him so hard. Pray for your pastor. Pray that he'll have the courage to stand against Goliath in the day of the battle. Pray that he'll just, uh, the devil will just get off him. Because the first thing he wants to do is destroy the man of God. And then he can get a foothold into the church. So pray for your pastor. So we find here Nebuchadnezzar's playing dumb. We all know the story of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And he says, I'm going to play all these instruments. And I want these people to bow down and worship my God. Just bow down, worship me, worship my God. But we find, oh, three Hebrew boys who don't do that. And you know what I never noticed in the story? We never find Daniel. I believe Daniel was about doing other business. He wasn't even there. These were his buddies, but he wasn't even there. And I promise you, Daniel would not have bowed either. There would have been four boys thrown into a furnace that day. But we find Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they had consistency, did they not? <laughs> not only did they have character, <laughs> not only did they have courage, it takes a lot to stand up against the king. It takes a heck of a lot to stand up against the king. It's going to get tough. There may be a day in our country where we're going to have to stand up and say, I know it's law, but it don't match what my Bible says, and I ain't going to stand for that. There's a lot of things going on in our country that this Bible says ought not to be happening. They are contrary to God's word. And that's when we as Christians need to stand up and say, God, with your help, I'm going to stand against this. So we see that the king sets up this golden image to be worshipped. Worship. Play this music. Worship it. But Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego said, uh -uh. we serve the one true God, the God of heaven, the God of Israel, and we're not bowing down to no image because we've heard of stories <laughs> of our previous fathers who bowed down to images and nothing good ever came of them. A lot of them got licked up by God and smoked and killed. We ain't doing it. We're going to have courage. Did you know that these men are captives? They have to do everything that he says. Or else what? He'll kill them. He doesn't need them. They're at his expense. You don't want to bow down to it? Okay, I'll kill you. So we find that uh, other people come to Nebuchadnezzar. Oh, Nebuchadnezzar. Oh, Nebuchadnezzar. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego are disobeying you. Now, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were probably over these guys. So they're already ticked off that he made these Jewish dogs over us. How dare he? How dare Nebuchadnezzar do this to us? And so we find they come to him and they say, Oh, Nebuchadnezzar, they're not bowing to your image. And so Nebuchadnezzar... Here it is. Do you remember a couple weeks ago when pastor preached on temper and anger? We find right here, Nebuchadnezzar loses it. Nebuchadnezzar, in his fury and his anger, the Bible tells us, snapped. And he says, how dare they not bow down to my image? How dare they? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, come here. They walk up there. Yes, king. Did you not bow down to my image? Because I have a good report that you didn't bow down. We didn't bow down. Okay, guys. Okay. Let's take a step back. Let's take a breather. Let's reassess this. Okay. And he, maybe he got down and he said, okay, guys, listen here. When I play the music, you're going to bow down. And they said, uh-huh. Yeah. yeah, we got that. We got that the first time you said it. Okay, okay, okay. I thought something wasn't clear. So you know what he does? He, he plays the music. So now we see uh, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. They're closer to the king because the king was talking to him. So here's the king maybe standing there. Maybe the king's looking at him, and they bow down. Here's just a parenthetic. How is he going to see them if he's not bowing down himself? <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Maybe the king was standing there, and he said, All right, play the music. Everybody bows to the king standing there. Way to contradict yourself, old King Nebuchadnezzar. <laughs> you're standing looking at them, and you're telling them to bow. Or maybe he looked over while he was bowing, and he saw them. So then he got even angrier. And you know what he did? He said, turn the furnace up seven times hotter. Man, turn this thing all the way up. And then he grabs his greatest men in Babylon, the greatest of the great. I mean, these guys are big, hulking warriors. And he says, take these three Hebrew boys, bind them up, 
and we're going to throw them in the furnace. So they do. They turn that furnace up uh, seven times, and the whole time they're standing there. Maybe they're smelling it. Maybe they're going, whew, that's going to be hot, but God's going to see us through it. And it took consistency in Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego to say, oh, man, even though our Goliath is standing in our way, even though it's about to get really hot, boys, we need to have some consistency in the Word of God. We need to stand for some things in our life, even though the furnace is really hot, and sometimes it'll touch your toe and you say, whew, that's hot. I really don't want to go there. God says, stay faithful to me. Stay faithful to me. And we find Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego stayed faithful to God. They had consistency about them. So they take those men and they begin to throw them into the furnace and those men that threw them in the greatest warriors died because it was so hot I can't even imagine how hot that was as it would hit them and they would die but as he threw them in old Nebuchadnezzar maybe was standing back and he said hey hey fellas didn't we throw in three guys why do I see four brother Hawk and the fourth he's like the son of God how did Nebuchadnezzar know that was the Son of God? How did he know? How did he know? I think you'll know when you see him. There's just something different about him. And as he would look in there, he'd say, Oh my goodness. There's four guys in there. Let me do the math here. One, two, three. Uh-huh. We threw three guys in. There should be three guys dead. Not four. And as he would stand there and he would look, Nebuchadnezzar saw the fourth and he said, that's the son of God. And you know what those boys did? Those boys came walking out and they said, whew, brother Hawk, that was a war. <laughs> Woo! Man, God's good. Can you imagine table talk that night? Can you even imagine that? I would love to have these guys over for dinner. Man, what would you guys do today? <laughs> what did we do today? We got thrown into a furnace, turned up seven times. And he's going, what? Yeah, and guess what? Here I am sitting here. I didn't even die. And guess what? We saw God. God protected us. God put his arms around us. Maybe they had a time of fellowship. Maybe God said, boys, oh, this is only the first trial that you're going to go through here in Babylon. Man, they're going to try to get you to do a lot of things. And yeah, you guys were consistent, and I'm thankful for that. But boy, your true test is about to come. This furnace experience is going to go away. Hey, Christian, sometimes your experience in the furnace is going to go away, and you're going to be left standing and they're saying, man, is God still with me? But hey, let me tell you something. Just as Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, God was with them in the furnace. He was with them out of the furnace. And it took consistency. It took character to stand against some things. Can I admonish you with this today? Stand. We see, I, I, I feel like I see the plaque all the time now. And I'm not going to tell you who it was uh, quoted by because I don't agree with them. If you don't stand for something, you're going to fall for everything. Are you not? We see that in our country. Better yet, we see it in our churches. We've given a foothold to the devil. Don't give a foothold to the devil today. Have some character. Have courage. Have consistency. When you know that it's Sunday morning, you ought to be in the house of God. When you know that it's Sunday night, you ought to be in the house of God. When it's Wednesday night, be in church. When it's soul winning time, be at the church. When it's time to read your Bible in the morning, read your Bible. When it's time to pray in the morning, read your Bible. Take a stand. Have consistency. I promise God's going to see you through. God can't work with somebody that he only sees once a week, right? It'd be kind of hard for me and my wife to have a really good relationship if I saw her once a week, right? Hey, honey, really good to see you. See you in six more days and leave. No. We need to come to church, and better yet, we need to be with God before we come to church. We need to be seeking His face and saying, God, show me something today. I need your help. I don't know what I'm going to face. These, Nebi these uh, Jewish boys didn't know that today they were going to be thrown into a furnace. Joseph didn't know that his, uh, that his master's wife was going to try to take a hold of him and rip him off. And then we find that uh, uh, Goliath and David, David didn't know he was going to face Goliath that day. But he was consistent. He had a personal walk with God. The best book I think I've read this year is, um, oh, it's written by Dr. Treber, and it has something to do with lions. I can't think of it. A roaring lion, something like that. But he's talking about the devil. The best thing you could do in your Christian life, 
keep a short account with God. What I mean by that is if you do something wrong, and even though I'm standing up here, I do things that are wrong contrary to God, and it kills him, and I know that it does, and it breaks my heart. Keep a short account with God. As soon as you do something, and that does not give you a license to sin, but as soon as you do something, say, God, please forgive me of that. Lord, I, I want our relationship to be okay. Had Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego's relationship been strained with God, do you think that he would have saw him through it? Sure, he's a good God, but maybe it would have been a little awkward, right? Maybe they, eh, pray today, eh, read my Bible, whatever. Stay in the Word of God. Can I tell you something? My favorite time of the day, and I am not gloating, pat myself on the back, I'll let my wife do that. The favorite time of my day is when I get up and get to read the Bible. Not only do I get a great cup of coffee, and I love coffee, but I just get to read God's Word and let it fill me and consume me and think about the great things that He's done for me in my life. Keep a short account with God. Don't let your sins get so far that it's hard to see God. Keep them short. So today, you're going to have to stand against some things. Maybe you have family members that don't believe the things that you believe. That's hard. It's tough. Stand. Show them you're consistent. Show them you have character. Show them you have courage to stand against those things. Maybe you say, oh, what does he mean by all this standing stuff? Maybe you need to get saved. Maybe that's the first step. Stand against sin and say, God, I'd love for you to save me. We're going to have an invitation here in a few moments. And if you do not know Jesus is your personal Lord and Savior, please come and I can have somebody show you in the Word of God how you can know without a shadow of a doubt that you're going to heaven. I can remember as a 13-year-old boy laying in bed and knowing that if I, slipped off in the hell, if I slipped off, I was going to hell. And there ain't no getting out of hell. Contrary to what the world says, contrary to what the Catholic Church says, we can pray about a purgatory. We can pray about, You can't. Once you're there, you're there. But God did not build hell for us. He built it for the devil and his angels. Don't let somebody fill your head with lies and say, oh, the, the, the Lord, he's so mean. This is why he did it. No, 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 no. He did it because the devil was rebelling. And he built it for him. He didn't build it for you and I. That's what I like to think about every Wednesday night. We go so many. Man, today I get to tell somebody that they don't have to go to hell. We don't have to go to hell. It's our choice. Free will. Free will. But maybe you don't know the, uh, the Lord is your personal Lord and Savior. If you come down here, I can get somebody to show you in a Bible. And man, we will rejoice with you. But as after that happens, man, the devil's going to try to fight you. Oh, that's only the beginning of your battles. And you say, man, that's, that's really depressing, Elliot. Man, that's, uh, I don't know if I really want that. I'll be honest with you, it's tough. And sometimes I don't want to do it, but man, the reward's good. Someday, you're going to be walking on a street of gold, brother Jeff. Someday, you're going to be with your mom and your dad. This old world, the heartache you went through, the trials you went through, ain't going to amount to a hill of beads. Have consistency in your Christian life. Stand for something. Help other Christians. Stand with them. Don't be a stumbling block to somebody else. The Bible talks about that. Don't be a stumbling block. Help somebody up today. Say, brother, can I pray for you? Sister, can I pray for you? Can, we, can I do something for you? Be a help to somebody. Stand for things. Calvary Baptist Church, for us to make it in 2016, we're going to have to stand against some things. And it's going to stink. But we have to do it to go on. And you know what? If I could show you anything through each and every one of these men's lives, God always helped them in the day of their tragedy. Always. He saw them through it, and they're now molded into great men where we can read and say, God, oh, to be like David. Oh, to be like Joseph. Oh, to be like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Have consistency, have character, and have courage. Let's bow our heads for a word of prayer. Our most gracious Heavenly Father, God, I'm thankful that you put the